Hello, Margie Bryant, and I'm here with Michael Shelwick. And I'll introduce Michael very soon, but we invite everybody today to be part of a global movement, to be global citizens, and be the change that they want to see in the world. And many people just want to know what they can do, and Michael will give you a lot of those tips and will share amazing stories with us. <laughs> and first of all, I'd like to just introduce people that don't know Michael, but he's well known to many people around the world. He was Western Australian of the Year in 2013. He's certainly an extraordinary, you were Australian of the Year finalist, mm -hmm. and you were the Commonwealth uh, Citizen, what, what was the? Uh, finalist for Young Commonwealth Person of the Year last year. Last year in 2017, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all sorts of other amazing things, best and brightest from the Sunday <laughs> Times. and. <laughs> has a background in law and in political science. Mm -hmm. And I've really known Michael and have had the privilege of sharing his journey. Mm -hmm. And he's the, one of the most inspiring young guys that I know. <laughs> he loves also Game of Thrones yep. <laughs> and <laughs> has celebrated his 30th birthday, but has an extraordinary story and has achieved so much in all the, the remarkable times. Now, I just want to give a bit of an outline for everybody to say exactly what he has achieved. He's all about a uh, global citizen worldwide, and Michael has galvanized 35 billion worth of dollars. And closer to 38 billion. 38 billion yeah. dollars in financial commitments to impact lives of 640 million, 48 million lives. Yeah, it's, it's, it's over 600 million lives that have already been impacted and we're on track for a further 1.1 billion lives to be affected by 2030 assuming everyone pays up on what they've promised to do and it's due to the leadership of michael and he has a whole team behind him and they're global citizens and we invite you today to be part of that movement we will let you know how to download the app and but first of all i'd like michael to share his story uh, at two levels. One mm. is he's a Rotarian and he's at a, we're here today at the University of WA. He now lives in New York, but it's really fitting that we're here in the WA yeah. University because this is where you got your law degree, <laughs> but you're also part of Rotary and mm. Rotary does rock. Yeah. And that's where I first met Michael, yeah. was at that Rotary rock function. Yeah. And I had the pleasure of listening to you speak, Michael. Mm -hmm. I was galvanized into action <laughs> immediately. And I want you to say how you were galvanized into action mm. by a beautiful man. And if you could share his story, the one that he shared with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, well, I think you're right on so much. Uh, it's, it's hard to think I spent seven years in this place, you know, longer than what I've been living in New York, five years, but in many respects, it seems like a long time ago, but I certainly remember the first time I met David Goldstein here. The Rotary Club of Crawley, or Rock, um, meets at the UWA Union Club every Thursday, and it was founded by, you know, a tremendous man, David Goldstone, and I had met him because Global Citizen, or Global Poverty Project, as we were then known, which was co-founded by three um, young Australians that, uh, you know, took me in amongst their um, mids, um, Hugh Evans, Simon Moss, Wei Su. You know, they had asked if I would lead a campaign to eradicate polio. Um, and what I mean by that is at the time, 2011, the polio program had made tremendous gains thanks to the leadership of Rotary International. They had reduced it by 99%, but there was a funding gap of several hundred million. And unless that was plugged, um, it was felt that the globe, entire global effort to make this disease just the second in human history to be eradicated would, would fall through, through our fingers, basically. And so I was asked, you know, would I lead a campaign, you know, to galvanize the leaders of the Commonwealth, 50 Commonwealth countries that were due to meet in Perth later this year. And people say, well, why, why did Global Poverty Project, this group of young Australian activists, why did we care about polio? And the truth is, is 
you know, our vision was a world without extreme poverty. But what we found is that people were very cynical that this could be done. It seemed very lofty. And what we felt was needed was a, a public win, something that was concrete, tangible. And what better way to say that the end of extreme poverty is possible than to say, hey, listen, with your help, you've just helped eradicate a disease. So if you thought that's why we were coming to the polio story, and I was asked as a young guy here in Perth, um, you know, whether I would consider, you know, taking on the mantle of this campaign. And I realized that I knew nothing about polio. And everyone that I spoke to, I knew Rotary had done a lot. They had started the global effort. But everyone I spoke to pointed me in the direction of David. And so I met him not that far from here, down in the coffee road. Shop. Coffee shop. And yeah, he, he shared with me a story. He said, you know nothing about polio, right? I said, yeah, that's right. And he goes, I want to share you a story of my best friend, John. And, he, you know, David was this time in his late 70s. And he said, going back to, I think it was the 50s, his best friend, John, um, was 21, Sydney, healthy guy, you know, runner, no issues, no problems. But one day he was walking down the central road in Sydney and he collapsed. And when he woke up, he found himself in this hospital bed, um, paralyzed from the waist down. And the first person that he saw in front of him when he opened his eyes was the chief medical officer. And the chief medical officer said, you will never work or walk again. And, you know, certainly he was paralyzed from the waist down. But, you know, David told me that his friend John had these three immortal words yes i will that was his response and he shared with me i was best mate over weeks turned to months slowly recovered the use of his legs um, so that he could walk never fully recovered but certainly recovered enough that he became a successful businessman um, he became a rotarian dedicated his life to eradicating polio so no one else would go through it and already you know Kind of understanding this it was uh, it was an incredible story but i remember as we sat there that morning um david suddenly looked across to me and he had stretched his hand and he apologized and he then told me you know it's just very hard and he put his leg on the chair next to me lifted up his trouser leg and there was a caliper mm-hmm. and a caliper you know, as well, there's just many people with polio to walk, and he said it wasn't John that collapsed all those years ago, it was me. And I don't want anyone's pity or shame, I just want to get on and eradicate that disease once and for all. And if you're willing to help me do that, then I'm willing to support you. And yeah, it was a remarkable friendship. Um, he unfortunately passed away, um, it would have been just over two years ago, it was July. 2016 but you know the years in between you know I learned so much from him and yeah I like to think he 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 died knowing that poly had been reduced significantly even in those few years and that uh, a world free of polio touch wood was only a matter of years away it's going to be in our lifetime, Michael. Yeah. Well, and we invite viewers. Within the next few years. <laughs> we invite viewers to really help with this campaign and become part of Global Citizens, and we'll let people know to download the app, and uh, we'll we'll tag that in the video yeah. below and the, yeah. the live. Very and so, Michael, there's a whole plethora of issues in the world, and we want change in mm-hmm. the world. We need change. We've got preventable, impreventable diseases. Mm-hmm. People can obviously do something with that as well. Yeah. So we can do all sorts of things, end all sorts of other mm-hmm. issues. So you mm-hmm. have gone along with the sustainable development issues in the world, which mm-hmm. is fabulous. Mm-hmm. And it's an amazing initiative that you, mm-hmm. you do. Mm-hmm. And Michael, what else? To please explain a little bit about your beautiful story about the gladiator when I first <laughs> met you. And yeah. this is for inspiration to a whole generation of young people who may be struggling at school and yeah. have not found their way. 
Yeah, well, I, I think it's important, this, this story, and, and how, I'll tell you how it came about, how, well, how I remembered it first, because I, I think it's important. Um, one of my best friends, Akram Azimi, you, you, you should yes. have on this show as well. He yes. was a former Young Australian of the Year. Uh-huh. A remarkable story. He once said to me, Michael, it's not what people do or how they do it that makes them interesting. It's why they do it. And I often advise people now as an activist, the most powerful thing you can do is to share your story of why you're doing this. Because that's really what builds trust. It's what persuades people and it's what people find compelling. And, you know, how I, you know, really thought and reflected on my why, you know, it wasn't an epiphany. It didn't come to me. (laughs) Nothing like that. It was, it was actually funny, a few years ago, uh, in fact, more, more than five years ago now, after I had finished my law degree and before I moved to New York, I went on a backpacking trip with a friend to Egypt, and we were um, journeying down the Nile, and we saw the pyramids, and of course, years earlier when I was 12, I had visited before with my parents for, you know, we were passing through, it was only about a day. But he said, you know, not that many people get to see the pyramids twice in their lifetime. And he said, you know, you saw them when you were 10, you're now 23, I think I was at the time. He said, you know, what's, what's changed within you? <laughs> what's, what's different? And at first I, you know, reflected. And I thought, gee, you know, it's interesting. I think when I was, when I was, 12 um, or 10 rather and that person visiting the periods with my pyramids with my parents you know I was a very shy very uh, inward looking um, child and in some ways introverted um, a lot more nervous shy yeah Uh, and the reason why this was the case was you know, throughout primary school, you know, kids can be yeah, cute, they can also be incredibly Bullying. cruel. Yeah, and, and I see it now, you know, mm. I, sometimes my young cousins say things and you're like, well, mm. 10 years time, yeah. you'll probably regret, regret you that. say that. But, you know, one of the things I had was a, a speech impediment. So, you know, thank you would become thank you. Mm. Um, three would become three. Mm. I basically couldn't get my THs, sure. you know, confused mm. it with the Fs. Um, which is quite common, yeah. but, you know, for whatever reason, we get teased from it. And then, of course, that affects all the other aspects of your life. Before you know it, it also affects your confidence, your grades from it. Even things like sport. I mean, I remember going to kick a soccer ball and just wanting to kick the ball and score and not not have it basically miss. Like, I just wanted to miss the miss a goal in the right way like an ordinary kick and somehow I would kick this ball yeah somehow I would kick this ball and it would automatically fly to the other side Mm -hmm. and so when I started high school finished primary school I remember my teacher called in my mum it was a parent teacher evening showed me where I was ranked and I was ranked bottom of the class and you know at the time you know he said you know way Michael's going I don't think he's going to finish you know, school, like school, let alone get into university. And I wasn't really bothered, to be honest. No. I had no ounce of aspiration. Mm-hmm. The flame was not ignited. Well, exactly. I didn't care, to be honest. Uh, again, Akram often says that sometimes people set so low expectations yep. of yourself that rather than rising above those expectations, you just live down to meet them. And I think that's what I was doing. And so I went, went um, through school, and anyway, we had to do this in-class assignment, and I did mine on gladiators. And, you know, I did this assignment, didn't think anything of it, did it on gladiators, the movie Gladiator just came out with Russell Crowe at the time. Um, you know, again, thought it was interesting, thought it was cool, loved history, but didn't think anything of it. Got home from school, and there was a message on the answer machine. And it was um, Mr. Byrne, year eight teacher. And it went something like this. Um, Hello, Mrs. Sheldrick. 
Um, I